53 years participating, Portugal finally won the Eurovision Song Contest with a very distinctive song. And while everybody else has moved on with their lives, I think there's still something relevant to be discussed here. Hello, my name is Luís Figueiredo and I'm the arranger of the song Amar Pelos Dois. So what exactly makes this song sound so different from modern pop music? I think everything. The song that Luisa wrote already had this kind of retro feel about it. In terms of harmony, it's uh, very jazzy. And then the arrangement uh, is not at all characteristic of today's music. It has no drums, it has no bass, it has no guitars, no sample music, no electricity. It's just one guy singing on the piano and a bunch of guys playing strings. Its jazz influences and the lack of electronics are some of the reasons why people are immediately reminded of music from the 1940s and 50s whenever they listen to this song. What is more impressive at first for people, I think, is the classic mood that it has. But it's a bit unconventional in some ways, probably ways that most people don't even notice, you know, like the structure. So the structure of a regular pop song looks something like this. This kind of form of two verses and a chorus and another verse and a chorus and a bridge and two choruses and then it's over. It's kind of a pop formula. Once we compare it to the structure of this year's Eurovision winner, we'll notice the first big difference. Amar Pelos Dois begins with a quite extensive introduction. Which I just found out is the longest introduction in the history of Eurovision. So... <laughs> But it's not just long for Eurovision standards, it's also a long intro when compared to its contemporary counterparts. Most songs take between 3 to 10 seconds to introduce the vocals. This song takes 20. I mean, I didn't make it that long on purpose, I just thought it made sense. I needed that length to introduce the vocals. But the differences don't end just there. It has two verses in the beginning. It's like A, A. And then the B is actually the, the chorus. Unexpectedly, we come back to an instrumental part, which is very similar to the intro in the beginning, but then moves to a different place. And then the chorus comes back again, and then you have like this bridge, because it's kind of like a verse, but it doesn't develop the same way. And you have no more choruses. So it's kind of an odd uh, structure. One word mentioned by Luisa in many interviews was simplicity, and this song does feel quite simple. Uh, sometimes simplicity is apparent. Sometimes the things you write can be complex underneath, but may sound simple. And that is a, a great combination of something which has lots of layers and is really well-crafted and has interesting resources in it. But to the listener, it, it doesn't sound complicated at all. It sounds easy. I think that's what I was trying to do with this uh, arrangement. Make it really colorful and strong harmonically. It shouldn't be really simple in that way, but it should sound simple. It should sound like a really simple song that you hum to your child at, at night. So it's simple without being simplistic. For the average listener, it's an easygoing song due to its minimalistic instrumentation. But even in its simplicity, each element has an essential role. The piano is almost always there, except for a small part before the end. The piano was used to give movement to the arrangement. For most of the time, I didn't want the strings to provide movement. I wanted them to provide either background colors or really foreground motifs. So I needed something to provide movement, to let the singer know and the listener know where the beat is. The piano doesn't play always the same chords, it plays always the same rhythm. The chords keep changing uh, as, the, as the music progresses, but the rhythm is the same.
And then there's that one section where there's only strings and vocal. And there the strings play the same rhythm that the piano was playing. Which makes it, you know, continuous. So nothing is lost in terms of beat, in terms of time. The fact that I always had the piano on gave me this freedom to give the orchestra different functions that I wanted to, because the time was being kept alive by the piano. There are also a few sections of silence that show up in crucial moments of the song. In the end of that section where the vocals are left alone with the strings, it ends with something we call a fermata, it's a suspension, you know? And so we need to breathe, both physically, the singer needs to breathe, and also, symbolically, music needs to breathe before it, it starts a new stage. Music is the effect you can create against silence. So if you never get silence, how can you appreciate the effect of the sounds you're creating? Amat Pilstois got an historical victory at the Eurovision Song Contest. It showed up on the top cells in several European countries, and there are thousands of covers on the internet. It became incredibly popular, even though it's nothing like what people would consider pop today. Uh, music is not fireworks. Music is feeling. Salvador's statement after his win at the Eurovision was controversial. We live in a world of disposable music, fast food music without any content. But he's right. Corporate music is manufactured just like a burger at a big fast food restaurant. So instead of having a melody writer and a lyric writer sitting around a piano banging out a song and then having production added later, the production comes first because you can make a lot more songs that way. The machine can make 30 tracks at once and get 30 songs in the time that it would have taken to make one or two songs in the past. And maybe 28 of those songs is bad, but two of them might be really good. And the percentage of two out of 28 is worth doing it that so way. So we've, we've gone from some sort of artisanal version in the workshop to a more truly industrialized version. That's right. It's industrialized. Not to mention that it's incredibly expensive to promote music to a huge audience. So record companies minimize risks by sticking with songs they already know will sell, which translates to lower risk music with familiar patterns and almost identical beats, which in turn contributes to many pop hits sounding the same. This kind of Western contemporary music is really poor in probably every aspect of music you can think of. In the melody, the, the harmony, the rhythm. Most people would say that it's about rhythm, but I mean, if it's really about rhythm, it should be more diverse in rhythm. The fact that it has a strong beat doesn't mean it's about rhythm, because there are so many rhythmic possibilities. Many of these songs have the same beat over and over again and over and over again. It's the same resources. Corporate music has become incredibly formulaic because the industry believes they wouldn't be as commercially successful otherwise. But if we go back a few decades, we'll find that the most commercially successful musicians steered away from conventional formulas and were way more experimental. The Beatles had stuff which was really conventional in many ways and they had other stuff that were completely unconventional. And uh, bands like Led Zeppelin or Dice Straits or Pink Floyd, for example, the 70s and 80s were a really rich period for that kind of exploration because of progressive rock and all that spirit of searching for these possibilities and mixing different kinds of stuff and playing baroque music in the middle of a rock tune, you know? So what happened? Why aren't there more musicians today making more diverse music like this? Well, there are. We just aren't listening to them. Most of the times people don't come to our concerts because they don't even know we exist. Because people usually don't even know that there are different ways of making music than the ways they listen to in the radios. Even though there are more platforms than ever to find music, the majority of the public still uses traditional mediums like the radio as their main source to discover new songs and artists. Now, there's nothing wrong in enjoying pop music. There are plenty of great pop musicians out there. 
The problem resides when we listen exclusively to corporate music and the current top 20 hits. Limiting ourselves to what the big industry wants us to listen to ends up taking the opportunity from other artists and musicians that don't have a big money machine behind them to put themselves out for the masses. When you're making music and you're trying to uh, sell your music and you're trying to make a living out of it, you face many difficulties. Very early on you get to this conclusion that the way you make music is not comparable to pop music. Uh, because it doesn't generate money, because it doesn't draw so much public. If there's anything that this win could show, is that it's possible to create songs that diverge from formulas and trends and still manage to attract a big audience. I was on the supermarket yesterday and the song was on. The thing is, the only reason why it was on the speakers or in the supermarket it was because it was the, the winning song of the festival. It, it, it would never be there otherwise. So, what can we do as consumers if we want more diverse music in the mainstream? For starters, we should be aware of what's being made, and the top 100 hits will never contain everything that's out there. So, we should explore, look for festivals that promote new bands, click on the recommended music videos and songs of artists we never heard of, search for music from different cultures and languages we don't understand. As a starting point, go listen to this playlist of many other Portuguese artists from different music genres. Most of all, we should educate ourselves to be able to make choices when it comes to supporting our favorite artists. It's really important that people know just enough about art and about music to be able to make choices, and that's not really happening. So I think that's the main problem, is that people are not choosing. So we, sh we should all have some kind of musical training, it's not to have 10 million musicians all of a sudden, but to have audience members that can make choices.